Um, first, the good news. Um, the daily number of COVID cases recorded in the UK has fallen for the seventh day in a row, uh, down to 23,511 people. However, uh, there were a further 131 deaths yesterday, uh, which is a highest number since March. So we're far from out of it. Um, and as we walk towards uh, the August um, date, I think August 19th, I think is, is, is kind of the date when we hope that we'll be free from all the shackles. Um, there's obviously a continuing pressure for people to get their jabs. Um, it's not really a neat segue from that really into James. Um, but James Renwick is an executive coach. Uh, he works with leaders, agencies, groups, and teams to influence and enhance their understanding, learning, and behavior. He has extensive background in marketing and communications and brings a strategic approach that helps leaders to communicate more cohesively through rapid change, influence more effectively, and manage relationships at every level. Following a degree in psychology, James spent 20 years in agency land, I think, um, or client and agency land, in leadership roles across both government, creativity, and uh, charity sectors, specialising in behavioural change, marketing, and brand strategy. He was responsible for the UK's most trusted brand, support, um, possibly my favourite charity for the last seven years, where he also led a 35 strong brand and creative development team, as well as running his own executive coaching business. He's a non executive director at the Charity for Civil Servants. No, that was a charity for civil servants. There you go. Um, he's also an associate certified coach and member of the International Coaching Federation. And he's completed both his postgraduate certificate in business and personal coaching and barefoot in 2020. And he's also a trained medical health first aider. So we're in very, very good hands today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, I can now hand over without further ado and ask James to unmute himself. Um, and we can begin the session. James, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thanks, Stephen. And um, hello, everyone. Um, it's really great to see you here today. I'm, I'm relatively new to the Pimento network. Um, I'm just going to hide myself for you because um, I'd rather look at you, I think, when I'm presenting. Um, so, yeah, as Stephen said, I've, I've worked with this industry um, for, for 20 years now, um, mostly client side, actually, 10 years in an organisation called COI, the Central Office of Information on big, high profile government um, marketing campaigns. Um, and lucky enough to work with some of the best agencies in my time there. Um, and then at Macmillan um, Cancer Support, leading the brand strategy and in house um, creative team. I've always love the leadership side of my roles and, and always try to adopt a, a coaching style, I guess, in, in how I approach that. And I was lucky enough at Macmillan to, to have access to some great coaching, without which I don't think I would have taken the, the, the pre-pandemic leap into um, a completely different um, career and retrain as a, as a coach. Um, I'm going to talk a bit today about um, how we can all be more coach-like in, in, in how we work, but actually in, in how we live. Um, and to kick us off, I'm gonna start with um, just a very short exercise. Um, it's based and inspired by um, someone called Tony Schwartz, um, who talks about energy. And whilst um, time is finite, um, he says energy is expandable. Now we have, you know, 40 minutes of finite time together. And um, I want to ask you a few questions. Um, so the first question, how much focus energy and attention do you want to bring today in this session? And this is a question just for you. So I want you to write down your answer. I'm not gonna ask you to share it. I don't mind what you write, there's no judgment here. Between one and 10, how much energy, focus and attention do you want to bring to this session? So one or two might be, you know, I'm listening, but I've got the radio on in the background and I'm doing the ironing, but I'm there. And 10 might be, I am fully with you today. The second question I'm going to ask, um, on the same scale of one to 10, how much risk are you intending to take today? So I'm going to build in some time for personal reflection. So as part of this, how open and vulnerable are you willing to be? And just write down your number from one to 10. And looking at the scores you've assigned to yourself, here's my final question. What small adjustments can you make in the next 30 seconds to help you hit those scores? 
So that might be um, adjusting your seat, grabbing some water, opening a window, closing a door, turning off notifications. Let's just take 30 seconds to do that now to help you hit those scores. So we're all the experts in our lives and um, coaching starts very much from the belief that the mind that holds the problem also holds the solution and, and so often the best one. But we can all get a bit stuck sometimes, held back by um, beliefs or assumptions or unhelpful thinking patterns that can, that can get in our way. And, and coaching is designed to disrupt these helping you um, stop and, and look at the stories you're telling or the scripts that you're living by in a way that's actually quite hard to do so on your own. What we're trying to do in a coaching conversation is to start to close the gap between our intention, our inner world, how we show up and our impact. That's how others, how others see us. And we do that through reflection and we do that through feedback. And in doing so, we start to build self-awareness. And with self-awareness comes increased performance across all areas of our life, as well as greater um, fulfillment and, and, and even joy. And um, I'm gonna offer you some questions in the chat, um, if I'm able to, to perhaps just reflect on through this session and, and going forwards. And those questions are, you know, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I noticing about myself in this situation? And what am I noticing about my impact on others? Um, as Stephen said, I've worked with um, and in this industry for, for 20 years now, and, and I don't think there's been a more important time for this work. The pandemic shone a light on the, the value of human, compassionate leadership um, and showing up authentically well-being needs to be the number one priority for businesses um, at the moment. And the way that we're all now working, we need to communicate more cohesively to um, better manage conflict and, and build relationships. Um, for continued resilience in the face of uncertainty. Um, one of the best books I came across in, in, in my journey into coaching was, was a book by Victor Frankl, and I'll, I'll include all of these in the references, called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, Victor Frankl was a, a, a psychotherapist and a, and a Holocaust survivor. And um, what Victor Frankl says is, is between stimulus and response, there is space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. What he says is we all have a higher level of control and choice in terms of how we respond to what happens around us. And that's something I've held you know, close to my heart for the last 18 months and I think can serve us all well. And from a creative perspective, you know, coaching helps to offer a, um, a safe, confidential space where we are better able to manage our threat responses that can become activated during these kind of um, hard times. And, and that paves the way for creativity and, and innovation. And we've all had a chance to, to gain new perspectives on, on things and, and think through, you know, what really matters to us, what's most important in our lives, and what do we want to do in order to achieve more worthy goals? So, you know, goals that are thrilling, goals that are based on what we want, not just what's expected of us. Um, goals that might feel daunting, that take us to the edge of, of who we are and who we need to be, but goals that are important important not just for us but actually for many people around us too. These are all areas that I'm helping um, industry leaders to to overcome um, in one-to-one -one coaching but, but I also offer group coaching and, and I love group coaching for a few reasons and you'll get a taste of it today. Um, firstly because it, it democratizes the experience, it, it has a lower price point per person and gives more people access to the experience and value of coaching. But secondly, because it helps to build a coaching culture. So group coaching build, brings together a, um, a number of different people, not necessarily from the same team, 
but with a shared interest or experience. And through the introduction of, of coaching uh, tools and techniques, some of which we'll touch on today, uh, listening with attention, questions and curiosity, feedback uh, and reflections, and, and thinking about the conditions for a thinking environment, we start to help people to support one another in new ways. So important as we all adjust to you know, the new way of working um, and where people are craving social and human connection. So I'm gonna share some slides with you. Um, can you give me a thumbs up, Molly, if you can see those? Great. So, I think we're all capable of adopting a coaching um, approach. And, and, and for me, it starts with, with attitude. Um, Carl Rogers was um, a um, humanistic psychologist and, and came up with this, this idea of unconditional positive regard, um, suspending judgments, and, and so important in, in our attitude as, as we adopt a coach-like approach. Unconditional positive regard is the basic acceptance of a um, person, regardless of what they say or, or do. So um, it doesn't imply you have to necessarily like someone or agree with what they're saying, but it does mean you put your personal uh, opinion to one side and receive them as they, as they are. The second point in adopting a coaching attitude is this idea of, of staying with, with the not knowing. Um, within coaching, we're, we're always led by the client in terms of what they want to think about on any given day. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty that, that comes with that. Um, so in order to be um, fully present, as a coach, we need to be okay with, with not knowing and, and to be able to dance in the moment with, with, with what emerges. Um, children have um, exhausting levels of curiosity, as some of you might have experienced. I have two young ones myself. There was a recent uh, US study I, I saw that showed that the average four-year-old girl um, in America asks something like 300 questions a day. Yet this diminishes as, as, as they get older and into, um, into junior school. Because as society, we tend to place more value on, on answers over questions. So um, maintaining this childlike curiosity says to people, you matter. You have my full attention. Ruthless compassion, I like to call the, the loving boot. Um, it's where you bring both uh, a high level of support with a high level of challenge. Um, some of you may have come across uh, a book by Kim Scott called uh, Radical Candor, and there are parallels um, with this too. And, and, and high support and high challenge is, is where, um, where the courageous conversations take place and, and where the long lasting meaningful learning um, does too. Um, and another great book, which I'll recommend, um, I feel like I'm plugging lots of books today, is by Michael Bungay Stanier called The Advice Trap. And um, what he says is clearly advice has, has its place, but also it has its limitations. Uh, the, the first reason is that uh, quite often when people come to us with a problem, um, the problem they present is not the real problem. And in jumping into advice too quickly, we're at risk of uh, answering uh, a question that's that's not the, the real question. The second is that our advice um, is nowhere near as good as we think it is. Our advice is based on our own um, lived experience and unconscious biases. Um, and the third, which is uh, I think more relevant for uh, a coaching attitude, is that by offering advice, we almost create a one-upmanship in the relationship. My advice is better than yours. And in doing so, it doesn't always help the person be as resourceful and tune into and trust their own advice as, as we can. So what Michael Bungay Stenier is saying is, is not don't ever offer advice. He's saying stay curious just a bit longer and rush to advice and action just a little bit more slowly. And it's a liberating experience. You know, it actually takes a lot of work away from us as, as leaders. Um, I love uh, Brené Brown's work, which I'm sure you're um, familiar with. Um, and, you know, she talks about um, the benefit of, of a thinking partnership 
and that the brain protects us from fully examining because it protects the stories that, that we live by. And someone else as a thinking partner can help to achieve new formation um, of thought, which offers clarity and, and confidence. So attitude first. The second, um, I think one of the most important parts of uh, a coaching approach and being more coach-like is, is listening. And, you know, this is hard. I think even for those who think we're good at listening, there is so much more we can do in this space. And, and this starts from the central belief that, as I mentioned before, the mind that holds the problem also holds the solution. And if you really believe someone can think well for themselves, you don't have to think for them. And the better you're able to listen, the better others are able to think. So, you know, listening both sets the stage for thinking and ignites new perspectives and ideas. And it can neutralize conflict. You know, how many of us, um, how many of us in meetings, let's have a show of hands, find ourselves listening to think through our next response? At times so easy to do and, and you know that takes away from 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 listening to to really understand and um you know listening not just with our ears but with our eyes listening with with our body language listening with our hearts uh, and listening beyond the words to to the facts and uh the values and and the feelings and 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 pausing this internal monologue in our head as it naturally judges protects or identifies with, with what's being said. Um, there's a great quote, which I couldn't find a, a source for, that says, sometimes what a person needs is not a brilliant mind that speaks, but a patient heart that, that listens. Another book plug. Um, again, I wish I discovered this um, in my leadership roles previously by Nancy Klein. It's called Time to Think. Um, she's, she's one of the, the leading thinkers in this space. And she um, developed um, 10 conditions for um, a, a, an environment where all participants are made free to think for themselves. Um, and this can, imply, this can apply in both physical and virtual environments. And I'm going to uh, give you a whistle-stop tour of, of all 10. The first is attention. Um, attention driven by the promise of no interruption generates thinking so rare you know how often do we get to talk knowing that we won't be interrupted so attention she says is an act of creation in itself equality so even in a hierarchy people can be equal as thinkers not necessarily as knowers but in uh in a thinking environment um everyone is valued as a thinker and everyone gets a turn to both think out loud and to give attention and when we know we will have a chance to um, to speak, our attention becomes more genuine and relaxed and our speaking becomes more succinct. Ease creates, urgency destroys. So ease is an internal state free of rush or urgency and creates the best conditions for, for thinking. And it's so important when ease is being systematically um, bred out of our lives you know, where we're expected to think under um, impossible deadlines and inside the injunctions of uh, faster, better, cheaper, more. Appreciation. Um, the human mind works best in the presence of appreciation. And what Nancy Klein says is that it takes five bits of positive feedback to overcome one bit of negative feedback. Many other sources cite at least three to one. And that's something that I, you know, try very hard to apply in my parenting, but is not always easy. So appreciation is really important and something that we don't often give our um, full attention to. Um, encouragement is around competition. And um, what Nancy Klein says is, is that to compete doesn't ensure certain excellence. It merely ensures comparative success. So to be better than is not necessarily to be good. So therefore, competition between thinkers can be dangerous and um, it can keep their attention on one another as rivals rather than the huge potential to uh, think courageously for themselves. 
unexpressed feelings can inhibit thinking. So, um, you know, we all know thinking stops when we get upset. But if we can express feelings just enough, thinking starts again. And we shouldn't fear emotional reactions. What Nancy Klein says is, you know, when people show signs of feelings and we relax and welcome them and say, this is important. What do I need to understand? How can I help? Then good thinking resumes. And she says emotions are like pain. She says, if you see emotions, look for the values because values are the site of the injury and the remedy are the key to the remedy. Information, I mean, you know, the purpose of attention and listening is to make sure that we have accurate and full information and that's the path to independent thinking. Difference, the greater the diversity of the group and the greater the welcoming of different points of view, the greater the chance of accurate cutting edge thinking. So reality is diverse, therefore to think well, we need to be in as real, as diverse a setting as possible. Incisive questions, we all live our lives having generated these beliefs or assumptions that can um, so often hold us back. And um, they're typically not helpful. And, and they're actually not often true, although we believe them to be so. So what in incisive questions can do is to help us arrive at a, um, a more freeing, liberating belief of ourselves. Um, and that can um, create new perspectives and, and choices that we didn't realize were available to us. And the final one is, as we all, you know, some of us start to think about returning to the office um, it, it, it is place. And, and when our physical environment affirms our importance, we all think more clearly and more boldly. So when our bodies are cared and respected, our thinking improves and thinking environments say to people, you matter. So, you know, in a way, place is a silent form of, of appreciation. So I'm going to stop sharing now and um, I'm going to invite you to reflect on some questions again, privately. Feel free to turn your cameras off for this. Um, I've got nine questions and, and we'll perhaps spend 30 seconds on each one. Um, and with pen and paper, or, or however you want to capture your thoughts, just, just write down what first comes to mind as I, as I ask these questions. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll regroup and I'll put the slides back. So the first question, what have you learned about yourself in the last 18 months? What do you want to change? What do you want to keep? What's taking most of your energy?
what is it that you want? How will this influence your work and life going forward? What help do you need? Last question. What one thing can you do or change today for the better? Thank you. <clears throat> and um, for those of you who feel comfortable, if you could turn your cameras on, that would be that would be great. So um, we often use this iceberg analogy when talking through um, questions <clears throat> and um, thinking about what others see versus the driving factors that that they don't. And it's it's our beliefs and it's our conditioning you know, our past experience that actually determines our behavior. And um, when thinking about the questions we ask, if, if we're looking to have more meaningful conversations um, and more kind of long lasting transformational learning, it's important to dive down below the surface of what's visible. And, you know, that's impossible for others to see. It's, it's often hard for ourselves as well. And um, an example of perhaps um, uh, a coaching client that, that, that may want, for example, some help to exercise more. You know, that's a, a kind of transactional um, issue that, that, that they've presented. Uh, at the visible um, kind of part of the iceberg, we, we might ask questions around, you know, what are you doing now? What have you tried so far? And um, they might say, well, I go to bed with the best of intentions. I get my kit all ready. And then um, I find myself just hitting the snooze button. And we might then ask questions that um, open up assumptions that are held at a deeper level. So what are you thinking or feeling about this? Or what are you assuming of yourself that's getting in the way? or what is it that you want? And in doing so, this might be over a series of, you know, uh, hours or, a, or, or a, a program of sessions, we might discover that, you know, they might say, well, actually my PE teacher told me I was rubbish at sport. And, and that's an assumption I've carried with me all my life. Or I don't actually want to conform to the societal pressures to exercise. You know, it's not something that I actually want to do. So, um, I find this helpful when thinking about our line of questioning. And um, I'm gonna offer you um, some, 
some questions that I think we can all ask actually in all leadership conversations um, that, um, that we'll conclude with. If you don't change your beliefs, your life will be like this forever. Is that a good thing? From the author of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I mentioned before that questions set the stage for, for our thinking um, and um, WAIT is a, is a helpful acronym to, to, to hold in mind. Why am I talking? Really try to allow time for um, that person to, to process the questions that you're asking. And it's important to, to think about your intention when asking questions and who the question is benefiting. So be a bit careful of asking questions for content or detail alone. It, it's likely that that's benefiting you more than it will benefit the other person. They know that. Within coaching questions, we, we tend to use how, quite often what, um, rather than why. Um, why can feel a little bit judgy um, and can um, result in a, in a sense of, of defensiveness. Um, so that's something to, to be aware of, as well as using open questions. Sometimes helpful to force a decision and use a yes or no question, but, but open questions um, quite often open up and help us dig deeper below the surface of that, of that iceberg. And, you know, questions are the root to creativity and, and to innovation. In Silicon Valley, they, they talk about questions being the new, the new answers. And it's often our own in, uh, uh, intellectual insecurities that, that can hold us back. Um, but actually absurd questions force us to think laterally beyond the boundaries and comfort of, of assumptions that we've created for ourselves. I love this quote. Knowing the answers will help you in school. Knowing how to question will help you in life by Warren Berger. So my final book plug, um, The Coaching Habit, Michael Bunker again offers seven brilliant questions that, that we can all um, ask in our in our leadership conversations and the first one he calls the kickstart question what's on your mind and th this jumps right to the heart of um, the matter without assuming that you already know and it gives the 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 other person the chance to voice what's really pressing for them what's on your mind great way to start a conversation the next he calls the awe question awe and and what else and you can keep asking this and you know going back to that iceberg analogy and what else helps helps us just dig a little bit deeper and is in response to that thought that you know the presenting issue is really the real issue so and what else and what else and what else the next question he calls the focus question and it can be introduced in a sequence you know what's the real challenge What's the challenge, you might say, then, then what's the real challenge? And then what's the real challenge here for you? And th th those two words for you help to personalize it. And again, kind of help get to the nub of what's really going on. What is it that you want? That, that, that's the foundation question. You think of the iceberg that was at the absolute heart. And it's often really difficult to answer, but, but so important. Um, and um, particularly powerful where the conversation might be derailed by frustration or negative emotions. And it's a question we can ask of ourselves all the time. You know, what is it that I want when I'm feeling lost or um, a bit stuck, it can help you um, get back on track. How can I help? Um, he calls this the lazy question. Um, we, we waste a lot of time, I think, um, helping where it's not necessarily needed. So, you know, asking how can I help gives the other person a real sense of, of ownership and autonomy in, in guiding you rather than um, you assuming and wasting time and energy. The strategic question, if you're saying yes to this, what are you saying no to? You know, strategy is all about making choices and, and it's quite often about saying no to things that we really want to say yes to. So it's important when um, thinking through our choices that, that we're clear on what the consequences are and, and often what the compromises are too. It puts things into sharper focus. The final question is, is the learning question. What was most useful here for you? And um, neural connections are made during the reflection process, not when we're being told something, not when we're actually doing something, but, but when we're reflecting. So, so not only does this question help to embed learning 
for the thinker, but, but it actually gives you data. It gives you feedback in terms of what's been most useful and allows you to learn and improve going forward. He says, one of the most compelling things you can do after asking a question is to genuinely listen to the answer. So thank you for your time, energy and uh, commitment. Um, I'd love to know what's been most useful for you. Um, and I think Stephen, we've got a bit of time to answer some questions too. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much indeed, James. Very thought provoking. Um, let's uh, put you centre stage and um, hang on. I think you are actually centre stage. So yeah, um, I'd like to open it up for questions around the table. Um, and this is your opportunity to, to, uh, to ask James directly his thoughts on a given subject. But before we do that, to get the ball rolling, um, a, a lot of the techniques you've spoken about and a lot of the things that you've expressed seem to me to be um, intuitively quite um, the ways in which actually um, the fair, uh, I'll get myself absolutely right here. I'll get myself completely tangled up here, but um, kind of Mars Venus situation where women are generally very good listeners. They have their ability to be able to listen to their friends, their family, be able to engage at that level, whereas there tends to be a male tendency, and this is not true, but it's, it's it of everyone, to answer with uh, solutions rather than actually listen. Um, how Do you think it's more difficult for men than it is for women to adopt some of these techniques? I don't know about that, Stephen. I hope that things are changing and, and, and have changed um, quite significantly. Um, I, I think for me, and, and having been on this journey, a, a lot of a lot of a lot of the thinking is stuff we already know deep down, and and we've either you know applied successfully ourselves or or most typically experienced from great leaders around us. So um, I think we're all capable of this, um, uh, irrespective of, um, of 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 our of our gender, and um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think we'll all have different opinions on it. I think there are just as many women that can't listen. I think it's not gender based, Stephen. I, I want to side with James on that. <laughs> I, I would add to that actually and say I agree with, um, with Annabelle. And actually my observation is, and I include myself in this, is that it has a lot to do with personality types. So we've looked quite closely at the insights. Um, we, we use insights. Um, quite regularly and if you are a personality type that is solutions driven it, it is quite difficult to shut out that close off that instinct to just solve the problem I think so I would class myself as a, a poor lister that's a work in progress. I, I love that I love that and, and do you know what I, I too am, am work in progress I, I think we all are and I, and I think um, the, the sooner we can realize that um, that our own limitations, the, the more um, effective we will be in, in our leadership. That's a great reflection. Thank you. Not another thought whilst everyone else is gathering their own, own questions. Um, as, as leaders, do you think we have, obviously we have a responsibility to listen, but I think we are kind of um, almost pre-programmed to make suggestions and trying to uh, find solutions. Um, what I've learned today from what you're saying is actually don't be afraid to offer up no solutions. Uh, don't be afraid just to kind of, you know, but, and I just wonder as, as, as somebody going to someone to get advice, if you walk away with no advice, <laughs> how does that, how does that make that person feel? Mm. I am, um there's clearly a place for for advice you know if someone asks at their randy house you know where are the tea bags and you say well you know where do you think the tea bags might be um you're gonna you're gonna uh, compromise that relationship relatively quickly and, and actually you know I, I i do a lot of and have done a lot of mentoring in in my time uh, mentoring is you know spending time with someone who is a subject matter expert in that field and they can give advice and shared experience so I don't want to take away from the value of, of giving advice. I think what Michael Bungay-Stenier says is, is just that perhaps we, we often jump too quickly into giving advice. 
And, and I think there are really compelling reasons in, 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 in terms of why we might not do that. And, and, and the distinction between uh, mentoring and coaching is that um, our role as, as coaches, and I think as leaders, is, is to help people to um, start to, to tune into and connect and trust their own advice and, and judgment and, and intuition. Um, and I think that takes courage. That takes courage. And I think a lot of the time we're, we're quick to offer advice because we want to prove how, you know, how great we are, how clever we are. And um, I think once we can all get to a place where we have greater self-acceptance and, and feelings of self-worth over self-esteem, there is then less need to continuously try to prove yourself to, to others. So I think it comes from fear. Thank you. There's a couple of um, observations and, and questions that have popped up in the chat box. First of one from Isabel. Uh, listening everyone is capable of, how long they can concentrate is the biggest challenge. I love that. And one from Annabelle here. Embedding a cult coaching culture reaps benefits. We measure this stuff and all the feedback shows how beneficial it is. Employees and leadership teams alike, empowering for all. Um, and actually, for those that don't know, um, um, or aren't aware, the, the latest round of the, uh, the tracking study, the Pulse survey that Annabelle manages on behalf of the Alliance of Independent Agencies, um, that goes out to all independent agencies, um, leaders and, and um, their peers within the organisations, but that, that closes on Friday, so if you do get a chance to complete that, um, I'm sure Annabelle will put um, a link up on this uh, chat box. Um, any other questions? Let's, let's go around the table. I mean, there's a few of us today, so it feels quite intimate. So I'm sure we all feel comfortable in asking questions today. Or, or reflections, Stephen, in terms of what has been most helpful for you from today. I, I'd really welcome those. Mr Hackett, do you have any thoughts? Hey, you know, good morning, everybody. Hello, James. I thought that that was, that was brilliant, but you know already that I think what you do is, 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 is brilliant. So thanks for your time this morning. One of the things I wanted to mention is I think so much of what you're talking about feeds into the discussion um, that is, I know, going on amongst um, in, in employers and, and business leaders about, so what does, what does the new better look like? And I think there are, there is such a fabulous opportunity, as you said, to stop and listen to the expectations of, of younger people coming into the work force because we know that their values and expectations are without question um, changing, have changed and are, are require some organisations to, to, to reset. And it's interesting that some of the folks that we work in the, in the more medical scientific world, the younger people, young doctors say to us all the time that until they are senior registrar, their consultants already told them, I don't expect you to question, I just expect you to do. And if you want to be an XYZ, you will do that quietly. Now, and that person, of course, is a function of the training environment that they've grown up in. But I think it's absolutely worth raising a hand to say we are missing so many fabulous opportunities by not listening to some of those younger people and to listening to some of the questions that they, they ask, because those questions are based on values that are important and they're going to last longer than the values that they've been that have been imposed upon them for, for over the last couple of decades. And just one last thing, uh, a, a, a really senior military guy that I was lucky enough to bump into just for a, for a sporting connection. We were, tra we were talking about training and, and the tough things that they do. And someone said, so, you know, what happens if you, if you want to quit or if you just, you're going through this training process and you think, not for me. And he said, his um, commanding officer said to him, Listen, no problem in, in, in quitting. If you want to stop today, I, I'm not here to stop you. You, could, you, 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 can, you can go now. All I would say to you is you need to wake up every day with the mission that says, today I'm going to make, I'm going to make a day that tomorrow I can be proud of. So if you just, just, just face the day on that basis, you'll be amazed what you can achieve. So it's a really simple thought. Um, and I think... But it's, it's just worth remembering sometimes you just need that one simple thought to push you through when you when things may feel a little bit tough that's all sorry i'm rambling so i'll, I'll shut up but thank you james it makes me think of um spirit energy 
and and Tony Schwartz again and you know he talks about um, there being four quartiles of, of energy we have physical um, energy um, emotional energy intellectual energy and and spirit energy and and so often in our um, early stages of, of employment it, it demands a lot of our physical energy and and our technical energy but actually as we step into leadership we need to bring more spirit energy and that's the why that's that's the purpose and and that's you know it reminds me of gareth southgate you know saying every game no matter the opposition has the potential to create a lifelong memory for an england fan somewhere that's the that's the purpose that's that's the why and that's that's for me so important in in our leadership thank you paul that's a brilliant 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 quote sean um I totally agree with you. It's, I'm, I'm aligned with your thought here. I can work on myself as a work in progress, but how do I help to nurture a larger culture with many more personalities at play? I mean, that feels like a, 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 reflection, a, a reflective, reflective question, but you know, I think let's lead by example here. We all have this capability within us and it's infectious. It's, it's corrosive um, in, a, in a really good way. So um, I think keep, keep banging the drum for, for the importance of, of listening. And, you know, those Nancy Klein thinking environment um, steps, they're, they're steps we can all take. They're, they're improvements we can all make really easily in our meetings tomorrow. So, um, yeah, we all have a responsibility for that. It's a great point. Alan Robbins, uh, great talk. I'm in the process of taking a coaching mentoring qualification myself. Lots of talk at the moment about authenticity. How held back do you think we are by the masks we wear and the identities we create at work so kind of i'm the boss so it goes sort of thing yeah so so held back brene brown is um she's got some amazing thoughts on on vulnerability and and um if you haven't already you know, look at her, her ted talks on on vulnerability and, and on belonging um she talks about vulnerability actually being associated with courage versus versus weakness and and you know i think to lindsay's point earlier on to to, to to all know our limitations and actually let's celebrate those you know as soon as we can um identify those and, and accept them and, and embrace them we can start to see where the gaps are and that's where we start to build great teams around us who can fill this um it's a great point lindsay i think actually you, you had another question yeah i, I was wondering James um what your uh, thoughts were I it's it's a, you know more so lately funnily enough um as we begin to get a little bit busier that we're all working from home quite a lot of the time and I think it's clear that quite a number of teams actually quite like that and probably will stick with it um but what what strikes me is that the the spontaneity if you like of being able to coach and mentor in, in a live working environment is, is actually so much better and that there are limitations by us all working so virtually. You've almost got to connive to have those opportunities. You've got to create those opportunities. I just wondered what your take on was, is it harder in, in a, a working from home environment? Do you think to, to make sure that you create those opportunities for people? I, um, I think it's a great question and um, I, I've been really pleasantly surprised um, in terms of um, coaching um, within this within this dynamic. I, I think um, what you perhaps lose in in the the subtlety of, of human connection and, and of body language of you know listening with your eyes, I think you can gain so much more from people feeling in a safe environment and and certainly from a coaching perspective that allows for 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 deeper more meaningful conversations below that tip of the iceberg more quickly when I think about um, you know the coaching I've experienced before in you know either hotel lobbies or, or busy office environments in meeting rooms where people are interrupting um, and walking past uh, there are fewer distractions, I think, to, that, that can really help those conversations. One of the challenges, of course, is that, um, you know, people are um, 
uh, fatigued with 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 Zoom and this way of working. And and you know, a coaching conversation doesn't have to happen like this. I do quite a bit of coaching on the phone uh, with with people walking in motion. You know, we don't have to be in the same space. But I think getting out and going for a walk, either in your one to ones or um, uh, kind of any coaching conversation can be really helpful and you know even pausing and um, if in nature just stopping and reflecting on what you notice and drawing meaning from that that can be really really powerful so um, so I, I, I had some concerns but actually I've been really um, pleasantly surprised in terms of how well it's working but from the group and team perspective I'm quite looking forward to getting back to um, some face-to-face -face. Um, but, but one-to-ones are actually working really well. You're on yeah, you're on mute, Stephen. Uh, 18 months into this, eh? <laughs> All right. Uh, Richard, you, you, you had a question. Yeah, thank you. Firstly, I really, really enjoyed the uh, presentation. It's, it's great. I'm a big fan of coaching and mentoring. Um, I've, I've been privileged to mentor people. I've also been privileged to have people mentor me. Um, I really liked your point around giving advice because I recognise as maybe a few of us do, that the rush to give advice <laughs> is, is the thing that uh, we probably do. Um, what I was going to ask was, um, I, I, I recently, I mentored a, a, a very good friend of mine who I knew really well in a work environment. Um, and I was able to, I felt, give and give advice. And I'll share that advice I gave because it's quite pertinent. But, but my question will be, um, does mentoring and coaching work better if you know the person well, or is it better if you don't? And the example I'll, I'll show is, I, I worked with a guy who was a marketing expert. He was absolutely superb at his job. Um, he was completely dedicated to his job. He worked every hour God sent. And he gave me some stuff once and I presented it to the board and they said, oh, that's just brilliant. I gave him the feedback. I presented it as his stuff, by the way, just to point that out. <laughs> and I gave him the feedback and I said, it was really well received. And he said, I can't believe that. I said, why? He goes, well, I just knocked it up in a couple of hours. I said, yeah, but you know, it was great. And he said, well, I didn't spend much time on it. I said, look, sometimes in life, and this is actually some, a good bit of advice I would give you, when you do a job, and so that's a good example, you're digging a hole in the garden to plant something. It doesn't have to be a hole that Carlsberg will be happy to put their name against. And he went, I can't see it. Because he was always working that going more than the extra mile he didn't know how to organize his day so my question is obviously um because i knew him so well i was ever given what i felt was good advice if it was someone i didn't know very well and i was in the first sort of stage of coaching them how do you deal with that that's a great reflection i i think when people ask for advice and when you know them well you're well placed to to, to give that i i think with coaching um it's often um more challenging to to have those conversations with people that you know well because you can't help but bring your own lived experience of that person and preconceptions uh, and i think you are you are at risk of being drawn into offering advice that, that might not always be might not always be that that helpful um uh, two examples i can give i mean firstly you know listening um i find really hard with my family and and with my children um so it's really hard actually to coach someone that you know really really well it just doesn't it doesn't work and the other example i give is um you know i coach mostly in the creative industry and the charity space that's where i hold the most relationships but but i also coach outside of those spaces so so into tech and, and insurance unfamiliar industries for me and it's often advantageous um to to coach in spaces where you're unfamiliar because you don't bring or project your own lived experience and and i think you you therefore bring more natural curiosity which which can really which can really help with a non-directive approach to coaching so um yeah i think uh, mentoring i think it probably helps to know that person well or certainly to know your field and industry well uh coaching less so Brilliant. well james just wanted to say a huge thank you to you for, for your time today and, and for the advice you've given to everyone. I think it's really allowed us to be very thoughtful, very uh, thought provoking. Uh, hopefully we can pick up on some of the techniques that you've spoken about um, and use some of the, um, the questions that you've raised. Um, we will share a copy of uh, the slides afterwards and there will be the video available, as I said earlier. 
Um, we are going to be continuing to uh, run our content across the summer period. Um, next week, for those who don't know, it's the 30th anniversary of the launch of the World Wide Web 30 years ago. That's uh, the Tim Berners-Lee vision of a universal connectivity actually became a reality. Um, I've got a fantastic um, uh, guest next week, just as we have this week, and a guy called Ajaz Ahmed, who was the founder and CEO of AKQA. He's arguably the most influential British digital web entrepreneur of the last quarter of a century. Um, and he'll be my guest. Um, he's built the, arguably the most successful digital agency in the world. Um, he's won more Lions at Cannes. He's been a named agency of the year 65 times, which is no mean feat in a 27 year history. Um, and it'll be great, I think, to hear his views on um, what he's learned in that period of time and also his views on where the web is going from now. Um, so if you're able to join us, there's a link in the chat uh, room there. You will be getting in right anyway. Um, once again, thank you for joining us and uh, hopefully uh, we take those thoughts with you for the rest of the day. And uh, once again, James, uh, it's been great to have you in the hot seat today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye-bye.